Father, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It is amazing how one small state, one small city, dominates so much of the world headlines, diplomatic activity, UN resolutions of condemnation, and world events. Lord, we know some things are coming. The Jews are back in the land. It is reblooming. They're sending fruit and flowers around the earth, around the world, as prophesied. Ezekiel 36, I believe Isaiah 27. They've regathered like dead, dried bones back into the land, and they're again a people. And sometime soon, Lord, the neighbors around them, as well as those to the north, perhaps Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, for sure, we're going to seek to invade them. It doesn't seem so far-fetched. And so, Lord, we pray as we see things unfolding. It reminds us the day of our redemption is drawing near. Whether it's a pipeline that can't figure out which way to move gas and oil, or a sudden thing erupting in the Middle East, everything can change. And in this crazy, high-paced, fast world, Lord, it can change overnight. And so we thank you for your word. We pray our hearts would be open to you this evening. We pray, Lord, for those in authority on both sides of that struggle, Lord. We pray for them to come to know you. Lord, Ramadan has just ended. And we pray for those during that time in the Islamic world who were crying out to God that they met you in dreams and visions. Please bring Jesus to the entire Middle East. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to see these things unfold. And Lord, how we pray for those families impacted, those who are wounded, those who have lost loved ones. May they find your comfort, Lord. May the peace of God rule in these things. One day, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And thank you, Lord, when you come, you are the Prince of Peace. So even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Open your word to our hearts tonight and draw us close to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to get a running start to chapter 4, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, or near to Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison, and you know what that's about if you read the other three Gospels. Well, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples, verse 25, and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, again our word see, or Ido, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it were given or be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ or the Messiah but that I am sent before him. That would get my attention, personally, if I was listening. Sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And there, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthy, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen, Horeo, to seen face to face, and heard, that, testi that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. A question came up to me literally just before I walked up. So let's review, go back to chapter 1, verse 32. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon Jesus, as him. And I knew him not, the Messiah, that he was to baptize. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending, note this, and remaining on him. The same as he which baptizes with 
the Holy Spirit. So the idea of the fullness of the Spirit upon Jesus remaining. God giveth not the Spirit to him by measure. Where otherwise, in the book of Acts, you'll see, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Peter. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon, but here, the Spirit of the Lord remaining upon him. He giveth not him the Spirit by measure. The Father loveth the Son, chapter 3, verse 35, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I hope that's you. He that believeth not, and you know who you are, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So chapter 4, verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, which is why we read that last part of the other chapter, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left Judea, southern part of Israel, toward the Dead Sea area. So you go below Jerusalem, that area, toward the Dead Sea, and just a little bit of the, the bottom of the Jordan River. That's Judea, Judean wilderness. He left Judah and he departed, heading north up into Galilee, the sort of region just to the west of the Sea of Galilee, that area going all the way over to Nazareth, and kind of that pass that goes through there. And so he went into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Okay. Well, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, which the idea is near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, hmm, that anticipates we understand something from the past. And so to do that, turn to Genesis. Let's go to chapter 33. Genesis 33. So in chapter 33, verse 17, Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made him booths for his cattle. And the name of the place was called Sukkoth. And Jacob came to Salem, or Salem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Cana. And he came from Paddan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar, and he called it El Elohi Israel, God, the God of Israel, El Elohi Israel. And then chapter 44, we learn that his daughter Dinah decided to go out and see the land. And Shechem, Hamor's son, liked her, brought her into his home, sorry, raped her, forced her, kept her in his home, and then went with his father to negotiate a bride price. Dads, how'd you feel? And Jacob's sort of working this out, and his sons come in from the field, and they get the details of what happened, and they're very upset about it. And they say, listen, we can't interact with you guys because you're uncircumcised pagans, and that's offensive to us, but we'll make you a deal. You guys all get circumcised, then we'll agree to co you know, coexist with you. We'll give you our sons who take our daughters. But they spoke to him deceitfully. And so they went back, and they all decided to get circumcised, and they gave it about a day or so, a day or two. And when they were healing up, Levi and Simeon attacked and killed all the males and took their sister back, which caused a bit of a problem for them in the neighborhood. So eventually they would move out. Go to Genesis 48 now. You can read the rest of that account at home. We're just trying to stick to the idea of this parcel of ground. Genesis 48, Jacob is close to the end of the road here, chapter 49, he's at the end of the road and prophesies over all of his sons. But he said in verse 21 unto Joseph, behold, I die. <laughs> and he does in the next chapter. So he's, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given thee one portion, verse 22, above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite, or yeah, Amorite, with my sword, and with my bow, turn also now to Joshua chapter 24. And then we'll go back to our history. Joshua 24. So, verse 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, Moses' assistant, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel, in Joshua 24, 32, and the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem. 
And a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, that guy who misused Dinah, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. Fine. Back to our text. So Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. And it's near to a parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. You'll find that in Genesis 48. And he bought it from the sons of Hamor. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. To the Romans, that's about 6 a.m. To the Jews, that would be noontime, sixth hour of daylight, sunrise about 5.30 or 5, depending on the time of the year, uh, to 6, and so six hours, you're around noontime, and that's the time we feel makes sense. Now, I want to point out something just to review. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, and the Word became flesh. John made it very clear from the beginning of his gospel, God has come down, taken on human flesh, and dwell among us. Fully God. But notice again here in verse, chapter 4, verse, verse 6, yet he's wearied. So he is also fully Man. Well, is it like the top half is man and the bottom? No, he's fully God and he's fully man. Explain that more fully. Okay. He's fully God and he's fully man. The theological term is the hypostatic union. Wow, that's great. What does that mean? Fully God, fully man. And John makes it a point, you will see his deity, but John also makes it a point, because the Gnostics who denied that God would take on human flesh, they thought all matter is evil, so deity would never condescend to get into evil matter, and so they would deny the incarnation of Christ. That was part of the problem with the Gnostics. And since you, you know, the flesh is evil, I can do what I want with my flesh, but I'll be okay with God in the spirit. That's heresy. And so John is making a point, knowing that heresy is taking root at this point within the history of the church, that he makes it clear God who created the earth took on flesh and he was man among us. He was weary, but he was God, fully God, fully man. Very important scriptures in John's gospel supporting that concept, that truth. Being wearied with his journey, he sat thus on the well. And it was about noontime, which gets hot in the mountains of Samaria. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat, food. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And you're thinking, why not? Okay, a number of things. Number one, generally in public, most rabbis would not talk to women other than their wives, even around that time. There's tradition around that. They would kind of keep their distance. And so for him to talk to her, that even among the Jews at certain times would be considered a little like, hmm. But she's not only a woman, she's a Samaritan woman. And you're thinking, what's the difference? Well, how many have heard of King David? Solomon? Rehoboam? Rehoboam, the kingdom divides into two southern tribes, ten northern tribes under Jeroboam. So you got Rehoboam in the south, Jeroboam in the north. The ten tribes, because Jeroboam's afraid, they'll try to go back down and reunite. He sets up in Bethel, the southern part of that ten tribe area, and up in Dan, the northern part, two golden calves. And they begin to worship God there in a false system with a false priesthood. That opens the door to idolatry. God sends prophets rebuking and all that. But eventually they became so corrupted from it that in 722, the Assyrians, not Syria from our map, the Assyrians, the area of Nineveh, they come down and they take them captive. They slaughter many and they deport some however many hundreds or 10, 20, 20,000 something people. They take them out as prisoners. And you can find these things recorded in the Assyrian records. They have it. Not just your Bible. When they took them out, what they do is take pagan people, bring them back, and, and settle them in that area to keep control of the land, plus get revenue for taxes, and to pacify, because now we're basically breaking up these people groups, losing their national identity, and let them intermingle and intermarry. So these pagans who move into the northern ten tribe area begin to marry with the Jews that are left behind, and those half-Jews are called Samaritans. 
Wonderful. The southern kingdom, like the northern kingdom, goes into rebellion a little while later, 605, first deportation, 597, second deportation, 586, city destroyed, burned with fire. They go to Babylon for a time out for 70 years. I was teaching chapel on Tuesday at Windsor, and I was asked to do the book Haggai, so I was having to explain to the kids a time out. And I was asking how many of them been time out for five minutes, little hands, 10 minutes, little hands, 30 minutes, couple hands, and like, ooh, they play for keeps in those houses. We happened to have a guy there who was 73, so I asked him to come forward, and I said, well, when God put him in timeout, they were three years old, and when they got out, they were his age. And the little guys are going. <laughs> Think about this. When they did not recognize the time of their visitation, and they rejected Jesus, they were in timeout for 1,900 years. They're finally back. Wow. When they came back from Babylon, the southern kingdom people, Ezra, Nehemiah, they began to rebuild the second temple, encouraged in that work by Haggai and Zechariah. And as they were rebuilding that second temple, the Samaritans came down and said, hey, we're Jews too. We want to help build because we believe in God as well. And they said, no, you're half Jews. You're not allowed to help us. Go home. Well, how'd that go over? Like a lead balloon. And so there became this animosity between the half-Jew Samaritans and the whole Jew Jews who looked down on the Samaritans as second class, as less than Jewish, as pagan influenced, and not really part of true Israel. So contentious was this that the half-Jew Samaritans eventually petitioned different people in history, and even Alexander, they talked to him, and they essentially set up their own worship system with their own house of worship on Mount Gerizim. So even to the present day, around the time of Passover, you will find they'll talk about those who have Samaritan origins offering up a lamb or whatever in the area of what would be today Samaria, and you'll find these, if you look for them, you'll find articles from time to time where they each year have their own observations that they still follow. So we have two now different areas. We have the half-Jewish worship of the Samaritans and the whole Jewish worship now in the second rebuilt temple that Herod beautified. So that's what's going on. And there's animosity between them. Fine. Here we go. How is it you, being a Jew, asketh a drink of me which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So... Bitter at times is this animosity that they would choose in Israel rather to go around through the King's Highway in the Jordan River Valley or go down the coastal highway and get around it that way. They would basically skip Samaria because they felt it was defiling to them. And you've heard the idea of shaking the dust off. The Jews would leave, the Orthodox, or they would leave and shake off the Samaritan dust on their way out. You guys are so reprobate, we don't even want your dust to stick to us. How's that go over? Not so well. So why are you here talking to me, a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? You must be in pretty bad shape to need my help, buddy. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, that's the word idol, if you could see, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence, from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? So you must be in pretty bad shape to be here asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. You Jews don't like us. And he says, Woman, if you knew who was talking to you, you would realize how much I could help you who are also in bad shape. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Uh, well, technically he's a half-father, but let's not rub that in. Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Note the progression. First, he was just simply a Jew asking for a drink. Now he may be potentially greater than Jacob. That's progress. Jesus answered, and saith unto her, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. It will not satisfy. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. That's ume in the Greek. It's a strong negative. Ume 
Ho aeon, never thirst through the ages. Never thirst the ideas again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well or fountain of water springing, literally bubbling up as the eye, holomai, bubbling up, springing up into everlasting, ageless life, everlasting life. Sounds pretty good. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. He's promising a water that will satisfy. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And he saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. Now, a question for you. What time of the day is it? It's about 8.02. No. What time of the day is it in our chapter? Noon. What happens at noon? It's hot. Why would you want to schlep water in the hottest part of the day when nobody else would normally go out for water? Why would you want to be alone? Usually it's a social thing. Keep that in mind. Go call your husband. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Now, what's going on here? Glad you asked. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. We're seeing scripture in action. Paul said, chapter 4, verse 4, or verse 3, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If you don't understand the things of Jesus, the sad news is you're lost. The good news is he loves to find people who know they're lost. Step one is you need to know you're lost, then it's possible to be found. To them who are lost it is hid, and whom the God of this world, that is the devil, who took away Adam's dominion through transgression and deception to Eve, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. Remember when that started in your life? He hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here she's hearing about, if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It would be flowing up from within you and you would never thirst again. You would be satisfied. She said, I want a cup of that. And he said, fantastic, go call your husband. Uh-oh, uh, I don't have a husband, verse 17. And Jesus said, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, rut row, And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, that thou sayest truly. Ooh. They used to make commercials like this. Want to get away? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? The light of God is starting to shine in your heart. You know why she's had five husbands? She's not satisfied. She keeps looking for that satisfaction, in this case for her, apparently in men. She's not satisfied. It's only a matter of time until she decides there's a greener pasture over there. So she gets out of this relationship, goes to another one. He went right after the biggest thing that you can observe from her personal life, and that is she just keeps moving right along because what she's looking for, she hasn't found yet. And when he talks to her about having a heart that is full and being satisfied, that got her attention. I want a drink of that. Go call your husband. And the light of God began to shine into our heart. I want that. Okay, if you want to come into the light of God, you want to come into the Spirit of God in you, then the Spirit of God is going to have to deal with your sin. And your sin is you've had five husbands, and now you're shacking. The one you have now is not even your husband. In that, you spoke truthfully. Well, let's see how this works out. The woman saith unto him, Sir, <laughs> I thoreo to gaze with interest, indicating or showing careful observation. I perceive, I can see clearly, that thou art a prophet. Now that's progress. First he was just a Jew looking for a drink. Then he might be greater than their father Jacob. She's now gotten to say, I think you're a prophet. You're getting wama, wama, nikolda, kolda, wama. Remember that game? 
That's how you tie up time with kids when you have nothing better to do. Play the hot and cold game. It's amazing the time you can burn. And they just keep going. They don't get it. Like, wait, I'm being played. No, you're getting wama, wama. Shame on me. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Say, we're going for theology now. This is getting interesting. Our fathers, the Samaritans, worshipped in this mountain. That would be Mount Gerizim when they set up their secondary system because under Ezra and Nehemiah, they were rejected. And they decided to go home, play their own game. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And that's true from the law. And Jesus saith unto woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain, Gerizim, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Question, how many of you sang praise tonight during worship? Who were you worshiping? The Father. Are you on Mount Gerizim? Are you on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem? You're on the edge of Chester Springs in Lionville. You fulfill that scripture tonight. When I tell you there will be those who neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem will worship the Father. Verse 22, you worship what you idol, you see or know not. We know or idol, we see what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. And right there you just explained all the headlines today. Salvation is of the Jews. And Satan is opposed to Jesus Christ. He is opposed to man being redeemed from his sin. He's opposed to people being taken from his dominion of darkness, the God of this world that blinds hearts and minds, and being brought through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to a sense of their need for God's forgiveness, their accepting of Christ in their hearts by faith, and their lives being changed. He is so opposed to that, he will unleash literally hell against that movement, that working of the gospel. And so salvation is of the Jews. And so this offering of the world to Christ and forgiveness is sent through him has come through a nation that he despises. And so this whole thing of what we see, anti-Semitism and all that goes on in the world, at the heart of it, it is darkness, it is satanic, because from the Jews have come the seed that crushes his head. You see, if Satan can wipe out Israel, then he's destroyed the credibility of this book. So there's one nation you know will never be destroyed till the Lord returns, and that's Israel. And there's one city, you know, that will never be just made a crater of glass, and that's Jerusalem because the Lord's going to return to the Mount of Olives and go and present himself as King Messiah. So if, you, if you're never sure, okay, well, are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? Just get on a plane and hang out in Jerusalem. No matter how bad it gets, it's still going to be there. Why? Because salvation is of the Jews, which is why Satan so horribly persecuted them throughout the millennia, and sadly sometimes even at the hands of what was called the church. Salvation is of the Jews. You know not what you worship. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. For the hour cometh, verse 23, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. The word is zeteo in the Greek, to seek, to look for, to strive. Now, please understand this clearly. It's not like God's going, would, would you please come worship me? Would you? It's not like he's just, you know, hard pressed to find some worshipers. Anybody out there? Would he doesn't need anything. But he actually likes to have fellowship with his creation. Let us make man in our image. And he made Adam, he made Eve, he made them for fellowship with him. He walked with them in the cool of the day. And he gave them one commandment. You see, if you don't have an ability to choose whether or not you want to walk in obedience, then you don't really have any meaningful relationship. They had to have the ability to choose whether or not they want to be with him or not be with him. Eve was deceived, Adam transgressed, the rest is history, we're in this mess. That rhymes. But without the ability to choose, how do you really know someone wants to be there with you? I, personally, I think if you're a billionaire and you're single, you got a problem. How do you know they love you as opposed to your billions? The ability to choose. The Father seeketh such to worship him. It's not that he's hard-pressed for those to worship him. But once you understand who he is, once you taste and see that he's good, once you 
open your heart and ask for that living water and come to understand the love of God for you? How can you not want to worship him? Once you realize not only are you forgiven, but you're given eternal life, not only will he forgive you in this time, but he'll watch over you to keep you in this life, and then he's going to bring you safely to himself. How can you not want to worship him once you know who he is? The Father seeketh such to worship him. For God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And you can do it from a prison cell. or You can do it from the temple mount. And the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah, that's anointed one, Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, which also means anointed one. When he is come, he will tell us all things. <laughs> he will tell us all things. How about like, well, you've had five husbands. And the one you have now isn't your husband. And that, you've been truthful. He will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto you am he. Let me translate. You're looking at him. Now, personally, you know, from an armchair quarterback kind of perspective, that might have been a really helpful tidbit there for Nicodemus. We know you're a teacher come from God. You're right. In fact, I'm the Messiah. I am he. That, you know, that might, have, that might have really just changed the dialogue into a different direction. But he doesn't say it to Nicodemus. Why? Because Nicodemus is a teacher of the law. He's keeping the law. He's keeping the traditions. If there was ever someone who could earn or work his way to heaven, it's a guy like Nicodemus. So what Nicodemus needs to hear is, I tell you the truth, you must be born again. Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You don't earn this, Nicodemus. You receive it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believeth upon him, you receive it, shall not perish, but receive everlasting life. Now the woman on the well here, she's like, well, you know, we're we going to worship here, we're we going to worship there, you know. And he says, salvation is of the Jews. You're not going to worship here. You're not going to worship there. You're going to worship in spirit and truth. Yeah, I know this will all be clear when the Messiah comes. I'm him. One of the most clear statements of who he is. He that speaks unto you am he. I that speak unto thee am he. <laughs> And upon this scene came the disciples, late as usual, and they themazo, the same thing Nicodemus did in chapter 3. It's going all around the neighborhood here. Nicodemus shows up, hears about he's got to be born again, keeping the law is not going to do it for him, and he's sitting there dumbstruck, like, how can this be? Now they show up, and here's Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman who's out by herself at noon, which means nobody wants to hang out with her. They marvel that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, well, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? That was a smart move, keep their mouths shut. The woman then left her water pot. Practically, what does that mean? She'll be back. And here, get a drink while I'm gone. Hey, uh, has she figured out the water he's offering is no longer literal out of a well? How many got it? Just me. Well, I got it. It was a good week for me at home. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Time out. Consider the progression. What are you, a Jew, asking me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? Wait a second. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Whoa, I perceive you're a prophet. Wait a second. Come see the Messiah. I would say that's it. Well, I'm up. well you're hot. You're hot. You're right there. Yeah, that's it. She found it. You meet a lot of people who acknowledge Jesus was a Jew from history. That's as far as they'll go. The search for the historic Jesus. Oh, great. Here we go. Then they'll say, well, we think he was you know, prominent among the Jews. You know, well, he was a prophet. Yes, he was. He told us all the stones on the Temple Mount would be left, you know, completely stripped off. He told us he would be betrayed, denied and rejected by the chief priests, given to the Gentiles, scourged, crucified, and rise the third day. Did all that and then rose to prove it. I would say that's a true prophecy. But you got to go beyond that. He is God in human flesh. He is the Messiah. So you'll meet people, they'll acknowledge him as a historical Jew, they might even acknowledge him as you know, one of the prominent Jews, they might even acknowledge him as a prophet, but a lot of people slow down and balk at the idea he's the Messiah, you've got to surrender your life to him and ask his forgiveness. That's the one they really have a problem with. But thank God she found it. 
in spirit and in truth. Come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did, verse 29, is not this the Messiah? So then they went out of the city, and they came unto him. And in the meantime, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. You know, we go all the way in the town to get food. We bring you food and eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. See, once again, they're going literal. Everybody's going literal around them, if you note this. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hey, hath any man brought him aught to eat? Who's, you know, anybody bring him something? And Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Remember, 39 times John's going to tell us that in this gospel. Sent me. My will is to do, or my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. What work? Redeeming man. The last Adam has come to correct what the first Adam has done. He has come to live a sinless life where Adam failed. He'll be offered up as a sacrifice for our sins. He'll resurrect again on the third day to prove it's accepted by the Father. And then we'll bring all who put their trust in him one day into his presence when we're absent from this body. He has come to finish the work of redemption. My meat is to finish his work, why he sent him in the first place, to redeem us back from sin. Again, you can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can only receive it. But if you receive it, it will fill your soul. Say ye not that there are four months, then cometh the harvest? Behold, or I do see, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, your ophthalmologists. What is that? Your eyes, ophthalmologist. Lift up your eyes. There's another word. And look, theomai, look and perceive with vividness. Get the picture. Look with your eyes on the fields. For they are white already for harvest. Many argue this is the people coming out to see them. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. This, by the way, is where Paul gets his teaching in 1 Corinthians 3. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. The idea that, again, the prophets have done their work. These things have been going on. Now Jesus comes. He shares with them. And now these Samaritans are coming out. You are reaping other men's labors and their faith coming to Christ. Jesus' earthly ministry was in Israel, yet he's going to reap the whole world for those who believed. He reaps where he did not sow. He sowed in Israel. He sent out his disciples. The gospel's gone all around the world. And when he gathers his church, he is going to reap the world. He reaped where he has not sown. Remember that in the parable he teaches. And so look, the fields are white already. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Verse 36 both he that soweth and he that reapeth, that they may rejoice together in the work of God. So herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. God wants to reward you for serving him, wherever that may be. And he will do it one day when you stand before him. And you want gold, silver, precious stones, not wood, hay, stubble. 1 Corinthians 3. I sent you to reap, wherein you bestowed no labor. Other men labored. And you are entered into their labors, as many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Here's the reaping. For the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So verse 40, when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought Jesus that he would tarry with them, and he abode there with them two days. And many more believed because of his... Verse 41, many more believed because of his... Does it mention any miracles? Nope. What does it mention? They believe because they, Akuo, heard his word. Note that because it helps to finish the chapter. And he, they said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and Ido see or know that this indeed is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And while they had, they, no, no miracles being mentioned, just he tells her about her life. She gets convicted. She brings the town out. He begins to preach. They hear him and they're like, that's it. We believe. No miracle recorded. The Jews seek after a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. 
Jesus goes to the half-Jews, who the regular Jews go, half-Jews, and all they need to do is hear his word, and they're willing to believe. It's almost like there's a rebuke here. Not because of your saying, we've heard him ourselves. We know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So verse 43, in contrast, now after two days, Jesus departed thence and went into Galilee. Something you'll note as we go through John There'll be what appears to be two different accounts or two different histories, two different stories in a chapter, and yet they're very much intertwined. That's important when we get to chapter 8, and some people try to say, well, this shouldn't be here, and it doesn't belong. And actually, it's absolutely in context, and what happens in the beginning of the chapter is the crux of the argument of his adversaries against him for the rest of the chapter. So here, we find the Samaritans, just hearing his word, realize he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed, Thence, and he went into Galilee, north, mid-northern Israel, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. How many have figured that out in your own family as a believer? I see those hands. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having, what? Seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went to the feast. Remember, three times a year, the 20 years old and above, you must go to Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Three required feasts for men. They were there. So he goes into the Galilean area, back to, you know, the whole Jews. There he testified, a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he was come, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem, at the feast where they went unto the feast, so Jesus, verse 46, came again unto Cana of Galilee. What happened there? Where he made the water wine, which would be a sign. And there was a certain nobleman. The idea is Basilios, which is a royal or uh, essentially an official. A certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum, top of, the, top of the Sea of Galilee. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea, the Judean wilderness to the south, gone up now into the north, into Galilee... He went unto him. So he hears that Jesus is close. Close enough, it's about a day's journey or so. He decides he's got back. To, I'm going. I'm going. He went and he besought him. Verse 47, that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, what do we need to give him credit for? Actually coming to find Jesus. How many are with me so far? I mean, that took some faith. All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to ask him to come, and if he comes with me, I think he can heal my son. There's faith. Everybody agree? There's faith. He, his actions are proving he has some faith in Jesus' ability to heal. Then said Jesus unto him, verse 48, except you see signs and wonders. Let me add, having just left Samaria where he didn't do any that are recorded, and yet they believed. How many are getting it? All they had to do was hear his word. Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe why is it I find more acceptance among the less than God's people than among, in this case, God's people? Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down. Anybody here the kid knows how he feels. Sir, come down, ere my child die. He's not giving up. And Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way. Thy son liveth. What proof does he have? What proof does he have? Nothing. He's got no proof that this has actually happened. What was he asking for? Jesus to come down and touch. I want to see you heal him. What is he being offered? Trust my word. What were the Sumerians glad to receive? His word. Verse 50, and the man, this had to be a bit of a struggle. Part of him wants to wait, part of him wants to go. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. He trusted him. You know, it's much like verse 42 here where he has heard something and now he has to make a decision, who is he? Can he do this? Go thy way, Thy son liveth. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. And as he was now going down, now verse 51, you might just gloss right over it, but it speaks of authenticity. 
Why? Because when you come from Galilee, you make the decline to the Sea of Galilee. From the region of Galilee, you get down to the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level. To go to the Sea of Galilee, you must go down. That's extremely accurate. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Exactly what Jesus said. Well, then he inquired, or then inquired he of them, the hour when he began to amend. And they saith unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, about one o'clock, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Thy son liveth. In other words, the minute Jesus said it, he was healed. And he himself believed and his whole house. This again is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. John showing again an interest more among commercial. It's all good, man. It happens to all of us. Do they have a coupon? <laughs> click here, click here. Second miracle he's done. And what we find in this theme is here, John, looking back, says, you know, it was the half-Jews that everybody made fun of who were more willing to hear his word than, than God's own people. Jesus said it this way. It's not the well that need a doctor. It's the sick. They came to seek and save those who knew they were lost. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've opened our eyes to understand salvation is of the Jews and of the Jews has come one greater than Jacob, greater than Abraham, greater than Isaac, your own son. And Lord, you often challenge us. You'll take what faith we have to come and ask. And then you'll take it places far beyond we would have ever been willing to go. Like that nobleman he had to make a choice. Lord, I don't know what's going on tonight in the lives of your people or people listening later, perhaps on the radio, but maybe they tuned in tonight because they've got something going on in their lives and they're looking for a word from you. They're ready to quit, they're ready to give up, or they're ready to go and do their own thing. And you're calling them tonight to actually walk closer to you, deeper, more in more obedience and simple truth that they might experience your power in their lives. Blessed are those who, having not seen, yet have believed, you said to Thomas. And so, Lord, how we pray you would increase our faith. We are seeing, actually, quite a bit around us in the nations and the turmoil and technology and all the things that we were warned. How in the world could John, on the island of Patmos in 90 AD, understand global financial systems, biomechanical or biometric identifications, and streaming content? Yet all these things he was shown clearly of the last days. And we're swimming in it. God help us to be looking up. Our day is coming, Lord, when you're going to call us home. Stir our hearts to be excited. And Lord, how we pray for those who don't know you. If you tonight are like that woman and you have been trying everything and your heart is still empty, you will never fill it. No matter how many upgrades, how many new releases, it will never be filled with the things of this earth. It can only come from above. May God give you the grace to ask for the forgiveness of Jesus tonight between you and him. May your heart be open. May you receive him as a guest. and He will change you from the inside out. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask for his mercy, and you will be given eternal life. Thank you for the truths of your word. Go with your people tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.